Hello, and welcome to another teaching from 2536. Today we're going to explore what's next. So after we've come out of her, meaning after we've come out of the religious systems that have been infected by the harlot, and we've removed all the leaven, what's next is the counting of the Omer. The counting of the Omer is a time where we learn to walk in the spirit and truth, which is also a time when we're going to be facing various trials. But James tells us not to lose heart. But as we count the Omer, to also count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. James provides an understanding of being refined by our trials because they test our faith in order to increase our endurance. But this wasn't a new teaching. The prophet Isaiah shared the same understanding. See, I have refined you, though not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. This is why James says we should face our trials with joy, because the testing of our faith is going to produce endurance, endurance we're going to need in order to overcome. The concept is simple. We can't just read a book about running a marathon and think we'll be able to endure the challenge of running 26 miles. We have to build up to it, and we do this through training, and this applies to our faith as well. Here's the thing. The scriptures are written to those who have come out of her, not just anyone who happens to read them. So when it comes to our faith, we can't just read the scriptures and think ourselves to be righteous. We need to put our knowledge to the test, which is why James goes on to write, And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What James is trying to help us to understand is that only by going through the fires of affliction can we become perfect and complete. Now most of us will read right over words like these because we think no one can be perfect. But the scriptural understanding isn't about perfection. It's about a sense of being brought to an end, to finish what was started. Paul shares this understanding a little more clearly in his second letter to Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Through his trials, including the thorn in his flesh, Paul was brought to spiritual maturity. He moved past the milk and onto the solid food of righteousness. This is critical because Christ isn't seeking to marry a child. He's seeking to marry a perfect, complete, and mature bride. And it's through our trials where our faith matures. But far too often we make faith to be all about knowledge. So we study the scriptures in search of truth. But if we never allow ourselves to go to a place of action, to test that truth, it's never going to be able to refine our understanding and remove our doubt, leaving us spiritually immature. For example, we might intellectually believe that a bungee cord will keep us from hitting the ground below. But that faith is of no value if it doesn't overcome our fear to tie it on and jump. Which brings us to the word complete. The context here is that of a bridal gown, a gown that's without spot or wrinkle, covered with lace and fine details of which nothing has been left undone. Each of us has been given an allotment, a portion of faith we're to care for, like a flock that's been put in the care of a shepherd. It's going to be through our ability to care for the portion of faith we have now that's going to determine the portion of the nations we're going to shepherd over later. This was the concept Christ was sharing in the parable of the ten minus. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. And when the master returned, the first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. To which the master replied, Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. Now when we add our understanding from James that we're to count it all joy, we can see that it's not about finding our trials pleasing to our flesh, but about the refining of our faith and the building up of the endurance we need to overcome. It's going to be through the perfect work of endurance that will allow us to become spiritually mature and complete. Because it's not about what we have in this life, it's about what's coming in the next, a point that James makes very clear. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And we're going to need endurance if we're going to continually go through the refining fires of affliction that test our faith, something Paul confirms in his letter to the Corinthians. 
Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. But the problem is, we've all been infected with religion, and religion tells us to rest in our knowledge, which keeps us from being tested. We see this on both sides of the river. On one side, there's the traditions of Judaism, and on the other, the liberalism of Christianity. But once you come out of her, you'll see the truth. Think of it like a lemon. We can gain all the knowledge in the world about the taste of a lemon, but until you actually bite into one, we really have no idea what a lemon tastes like. This is known as truth through wisdom or truth through understanding. And this is the message Christ was sharing in the parable of the ten virgins. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now all ten virgins had a lamp which symbolizes the word. The word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. But a lamp requires oil in order to produce light. In other words, it's one thing to know the truth, it's another to walk in it. And those who walk in the truth were wise, having gained wisdom as they experienced the Father's instructions through Christ. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. These are those who Peter warns sit under ignorant and unstable teachers who twist the scriptures to their own destruction and get carried away into the air of lawlessness and eventually will fall from their secure position. They have the word, but they lack wisdom because they never had the faith to apply it. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell the oil and buy some for yourselves. Now it's interesting on how the wise virgins wouldn't give any of their oil to the foolish ones. So the foolish virgins had to leave their secure position just outside the banquet in order to go buy some. But if oil symbolizes wisdom, is it possible to buy wisdom? Yes. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction and insight as well. What this proverb is telling us is that wisdom comes through experience, and that experience is what our parents are trying to pass down to us as an inheritance. But since most of us are foolish, we ignore the wisdom of our parents and seek to make our own way. Thus we pay the price to gain wisdom, and that price can often be extremely high. Sadly, most of us do this with our Heavenly Father's instructions as well. The word of the Father is like a lamp unto our feet. But if we don't have the faith to walk in it, it will never come alive within us. Thus, our faith is dead. But only those who walk in faith will gain the wisdom that's able to light the lamp and fill the house with light. This is the context Christ had when he said, You are a light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. But what we see is how the legalist, meaning those who follow the law or some other form of denominational defined doctrine, seek to sanctify themselves through the circumcision of their flesh and the works of their hands. They are not able to cast out any light because the righteousness of Christ is hidden under the bowl, which is the written code that they follow. Christ gave us an example of how the written code can cover his righteousness during his Sermon on the Mount when he said, It is written, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who has lust for another woman is guilty of adultery in their heart. Can you see how the righteousness of Christ is hidden by the written code in the sense that it hides the truth of our heart? Christ tells us that the legalist, like the Pharisee, become like a whitewashed tomb that looks good on the outside, but inside they're filled with the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Then there's the liberalist, those who follow their own form of righteousness, having followed the ignorant and unstable into the error of lawlessness. They're unable to cast any light because the righteousness of Christ is not in them, having become born of religion and not of the Holy Spirit. 
but the faithful disciple knows that obedience must be yoked to and dependent on the grace of the Father. Often we think of a yoke as something oppressive, like an ox who's yoked to a plow. But a yoke is simply a device that connects and directs, and this is why Christ told us, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. To be yoked with Christ is to become one with the living word. Now with the circumcised heart, we are free from our slavery of sin, allowing us to be directed by the Holy Spirit. This brings glory to the Father as the good works we do will shine like a light throughout the entire house. So now that we have the proper context of understanding from James, let's explore this from a slightly different perspective. In Proverbs 8, we're told, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his word of old. I have been established from everlasting from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. Now the beginning of his way was in the fruitlessness of our own way, the way we were going before we were redeemed. I like to think of it as being poured out like a drink offering, as oil being poured out to anoint a king. That oil came from the pressings of the olive, which symbolizes the pressings of our trials. It's easy to see how it's through the pressings of our trials that our faith is tested. And if we take a moment to reflect back, I think we'd all agree that we've picked up at least a little wisdom along the way as the result of our trials. Some call it graduating from the school of hard knocks. It's through the wisdom we've gained that provides the authority to speak life into others who are going through similar situations, which is the very purpose of the scriptures, to provide wisdom. Paul puts it like this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So to paraphrase Paul, we're to gain knowledge of the scriptures in order to be thoroughly equipped for work. And the work of the Father is to gain faith, which can only happen by putting what we've learned into action. So why is this important? In the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we read that they didn't go into the fire kicking and screaming or begging for their lives. They were at peace because they had built their faith in the Father through their trials to the point that they had overcome their fear of death and replaced it with a fear of the Lord. I believe this is the understanding Paul had when he wrote, Therefore we are always confident, and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now it's easy to see how the faith of these three men grew as the result of their trial. But what's often missed is the impact of the faith on all those who witnessed it. Not just because they went through the fire and lived, but the way that they went into the fire. They didn't go through their trial in fear. They went through their trial in peace. So to be a light unto the world, we not only need to pass the test, we must face the trial with joy and then remain faithful to the Father. For example, if our car breaks down, do we freak out wondering how we'll get home? Later, do we abandon the Father's Sabbath so we can work overtime to pay for the repairs? Or, do we produce fruit in keeping with repentance? Look, we've all experienced a time when, like the Israelites, we heard the good news but didn't combine it with faith. Instead, we sought to make our own way by using the works of our hands or the use of deception to save us, only to experience the consequences that followed. This is why we must remain faithful to the Word during our times of trial. Because if we're not faithful during our trials, we're not going to gain the wisdom that comes from them and those who fail to learn from the past are destined to repeat it, meaning we'll likely fall into the same traps over and over again because we have the knowledge in our head but no wisdom in our heart. Why is this important? Christ himself gives us the answer. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. One of the good things a man has stored in his heart is wisdom, but that wisdom isn't just for them. Let's take a look at Proverbs 20. The lazy one does not plow after the autumn, so he begs during the harvest and has nothing. The tilling of the ground is an analogy for discipleship, or the tilling of our heart. The lazy student doesn't till their heart, 
so the truth of the Father's word falls on their stony heart and is unable to take root. This is why the lazy student remains in the classroom. But when the time of the harvest comes, they have nothing to offer because they never sowed any seed. This is the liberalist who demonstrates that faith without works is dead. Their faith has been choked out by the worries of this world, so they're unable to enter into the joy of their master. The word was never able to produce fruit because it was never planted in their heart. This is why we're given so many warnings of the coming tribulation and how there's going to be a time of great testing. But sadly, there's still going to be a lot of believers who will be playing around in their religion when it comes. For many, when this time of testing comes, they're going to realize that they lack faith because they did nothing to till up and remove the stones in their field, which symbolize the idols they have built up in their heart. If we continue with Proverbs 20, we see that the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but the one who has insight draws them out. And this is why Christ tells us, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. We see the same understanding in Proverbs 18. The words of the mouth are deep waters, but the fountain of wisdom is a rushing stream. The fountain of wisdom counsels the heart like deep water but those who have understanding are able to draw it up. You see, it's not enough to have this fountain of wisdom within us. We must be able to draw from it to give others to drink. I hope you're able to see the symbolism being used here. We don't go through our trials just so that our own faith will grow. We go through these trials so that we're able to serve others, so that their faith can grow as well. So wisdom comes through our trials and is stored up in our heart. This is so we're able to draw it up and give it to others. The lazy man who fails to plow their field has nothing to offer when these trials come, which is why some who have been on this journey for a long time still lack faith. It's like they're trying to get in shape by going to the gym for an hour a week, but then eat junk food and lay around watching TV the rest of the time. This lack of wisdom is what allows outside influences to impact Christianity. And by looking at these influences, we can get a pretty good idea of where Christianity has been and where it's heading. For example, there's been a lot of noise about two things going on right now. One is the Asbury Revival, and the other is the release of the movie Jesus Revolution. The majority of Christian doctrines today were developed from the edicts that came out of the Council of Nicaea, which caused Christianity to veer sharply from the narrow path. Since Christianity was built on the sands of these abstract notions and influences of men, it's easy for it to continue to be influenced by the same. For example, the impact the Summer of Love had on Christianity not only changed the direction of Christianity, but it changed the gospel itself. The message was no longer about repentance, but of love and acceptance. Sadly, this caused mainstream Christianity to veer even further from the narrow path, and without repentance would make it nearly impossible for its followers to hear the Father's call to come out of her. Add to this a lack of understanding between godly love and worldly love, the message of Christianity has become even more muddied. For a more detailed understanding of these differences, we recommend our teaching Godly Love versus Worldly Love. Now if you're wondering where mainstream Christianity might be headed, we just need to pay attention to the message coming out of the Asbury Revival, which is a message of tolerance and inclusion. The question is, will the drumbeat of tolerance and inclusion form yet another way? I believe Paul provides the answer in his second letter to Timothy. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, but not lovers of the good. Now let me explain where I'm going with this and why it's important. In Revelation 22 we read this, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Notice, both the Spirit and the Bride say come, not just the Spirit. And what is it the Spirit and the Bride are offering? They're offering the free gift of the water of life. 
Notice the bride is helping to dispense this living water. So one of the functions of the bride is to dispense wisdom. And this is going to be especially true during the millennial reign. But if we haven't been refined in the fires of affliction, we won't have any wisdom to offer. We see this analogy and symbolism throughout the Torah. For example, when Abraham sent his servant to find a bride for his son Isaac, we read, He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was towards evening, the time the women go to draw water. Now when the servant arrived to the location where he was to select a bride for his master's son, he goes to the well and recites this prayer. May it be that when I say to a young woman, Please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, Drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Notice the servant isn't looking for a bride who offers him a little water. He's seeking a bride who can offer enough to water his camels too. In other words, the bride must be a spring of living water in order to be suitable for his master's son. We're also told that the servant took ten of his master's camels, which represent the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, also known as the house of Israel. He also took all kinds of his master's good things with him when he set out. And the evidence to determine the potential bride's love and commitment would be her willingness and ability to provide water. This is a shadow of the Spirit saying, Let the woman, the bride of the Son of the Father, let her draw down and bring up living water for you to drink and let her have such strength and wisdom that she draws down enough water for all the tribes of Israel. I hope you're able to see the symbolism here and how the bride anointed by the Father is going to draw down living water and offer it, not only to the Father's servant, but to all who are thirsty. This should help bring some context to what Christ is telling us when he shares the story of the separation between the sheep and the goats. Christ begins by saying, All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So when the nations are gathered before him for judgment, Christ himself is going to separate them. And he gives us the criteria he's going to use to do it. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Now many believers are willing and able to offer the bread which is symbolized by the written word. They're quick to offer a quote of scripture or some encouraging cliche. But we're told that the bride will also be able to provide drink, which is wisdom and understanding, having experienced the word through Christ. Not every bride or shepherd is going to be able to offer you living water. Let's look at an example where the shepherds refuse to let the future brides drink. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flocks. Notice that when the daughters of the priest, meaning potential brides, came to draw water, they were met with opposition. But the opposition didn't come from an enemy. It came from shepherds. And who are these shepherds? Son of man, Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to you shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? Now woe to you shepherds who have been feeding themselves and not taking care of their flocks. Now we often think of prosperity preachers when we read this, but it goes to those pastors who are not teaching past the milk of the gospel and onto the way of righteousness as well. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? Must you also trample the rest of your pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the rest of it with your feet? So who are we being warned about? The shepherds. And the warning isn't that they'll just keep us from the water, but that they'll muddy it up as well. And this is why Christ himself warned us to beware of wolves in sheep's clothing and the leaven of the Pharisees. We see the muddying of the waters in the thousands of denominational doctrines, and the wisdom of Solomon who told us there's nothing new under the sun. So while we're being instructed to drink the living water, we're also being told to be aware of the well in which the drink came from. 
for many false prophets, along with ignorant and unstable men, are going to be there muddying it up. The drinking of what has been muddied by the feet of the shepherd is a warning that will find a lot of truth in Christianity and Judaism. We'll even find truth in other religions as well. But the truth will be muddied. It will have been trampled upon. This becomes obvious when we look back at the Jesus Revolution, where the religious leaders saw an opportunity to gain followers by dropping the difficult message of repentance and adopting the cultural, feel-good message of love. This twisting of the gospel was done because the shepherds wanted to feed themselves first by filling the seats at the risk of starving their flocks. Now we see examples of this on both sides of the river. On one side we have all the traditions and how the law is to be strictly applied, while on the other we have all these denominational rules and doctrines and how they're to be applied. It's a lot of do this, don't do that, all focused on providing an outward appearance of godliness. But Christ warned, those who do this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Remember the shepherds who Moses drove away because they wouldn't allow the potential brides to drink from the well? This is the context Christ had when he says, Woe to you pastors, you teachers, you religious leaders! You have fenced in your flocks with your religious doctrines, and you've kept them from drinking the living water and finding the good pastures. These shepherds take away the understanding of righteousness, which keeps their flocks from being able to have the righteousness of Christ fulfilled in their hearts. Thus, they're not building their faith in Christ, they're building their faith in themselves, and their own faithfulness to follow their religious doctrines and traditions. Anytime we take away from or add to the Father's instructions, we run the risk of muddying the living water. For example, the Father instructs us to keep the Sabbath holy. Our brother Judah ties his flock up with a list of hundreds of do's and don'ts of what this means, while our Christian brothers have taken away this instruction entirely. In both cases, the understanding of righteousness comes from following the word that came from the voice of their shepherd and not following Christ, the word that comes from the voice of the Father. And this is why we're given the following warning. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. It's during the Feast of Unleavened Bread when we became aware of all the man-made doctrines and traditions that have found their way into our worship. Then, in our own will and strength, we seek to remove the leaven from our house, meaning these false practices from our worship. We stop observing pagan holidays, and we begin to keep the feasts and the Sabbath. This is followed by the Feast of Shavuot, Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit is poured out and our eyes are opened to the true leaven, the leaven that's in our hearts, this is where we see that, sure, we might have stopped observing pagan holidays, but in our heart we still long for them. This is where we see how much influence Babylon really has in our worship, and how tight her grip is on us, and how she has led our shepherds to muddy the waters. And this is when we need to ask ourselves, is my shepherd keeping me from the well by walling me in with their doctrine? Am I following the rules of my shepherd over the word of the Father? Let's take a look at what Christ had to say about all this. Christ said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And this is why a spiritual drought has come over the land, which is what we were warned about would happen. The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. This is why so many hop from church to church or teacher to teacher. They're seeking for the truth. But here's the thing. The truth is in you. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven, so you have to ask who will ascend into heaven and get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart, so you may obey it. 
So if you're out searching for the path to the living water, water that is clear and easy to drink, take heed of this warning from Amos. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as surely as your God lives, Dan, or as surely as the God of Beersheba lives, they will fall never to rise again. Samaria is part of the northern kingdom and the ten tribes of the house of Israel who were divorced from the father because of their idolatry. It was in the settlement of Dan where they set up their false idols. So the understanding is those who are thirsting for the living water are those who are caught up in idolatry. They are the ones who are stuck in a religious system that's filled with spiritual adultery. They are following shepherds who have inherited lies and are passing those lies on to their flocks. Sadly, it's getting harder and harder to find a clean well to drink from, because as Amos prophesied, there's a drought. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. Remember, it's the spirit and the bride who say come. Come drink from the fountains of living water. But the religious systems of today have been infected by the harlot, and the voice of the bride and bridegroom is no longer heard. This is a warning that it's going to get harder and harder to find a clean well to drink from. So if you found one, don't take it lightly. Sure, you might need to salt the water from time to time, as no teacher has all the answers or is able to describe everything perfectly. But as Christ told us, by their fruit you will recognize them. We hope you have found this teaching helpful, and as always, may you be blessed in your pursuit of truth. Shalom.